Black and Powerful is brought to you by the Black McDonald's Operators Association. Chicagoan. First generation Haitian American. A family man. Cancer survivor. Former prosecutor, state senator, now Illinois Attorney General. Passionate about creating change. Our guest, Kwame Raoul, black and powerful. Kwame Raoul, thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Black and Powerful. Tell me about your childhood. You were born on the south side of Chicago? Yep, yep south side, mid-south side. Uh, um, you know, first started living in the Chatham area and then uh, my family moved to Hyde Park in, in about 1967. Um, my, uh, my dad bought a house uh, uh, on a now famous block uh, because, uh, you know, uh, Barack Obama would buy a house on that block e decades le later and uh, I'd be able to say who's following who and uh, because I grew up on the block that he eventually uh, bought, bought a house on. But uh, my, I was a child of uh, Haitian immigrants. My father was a, a physician from um, port au Haiti, and my mother was from Port-au-Prince. They meet, met in New York. And uh, my dad, after doing his training in New York, settled here in Chicago and served as a community physician on the South Side for th uh, 30 years and uh, raised uh, me and my sisters uh, in the Hyde Park community. So what was it growing up? the child of immigrants. Do, was there something that you, that they instilled in you? Most, most certainly. Um, you know, my parents never forgot uh, from where they came and uh, they instilled that in, into us. So notwithstanding the fact that, um, you know, my parents invested well in my education, uh, they made sure that I va valued the penny, right? And, uh, um, you know, I was not spoiled with regards to access to uh, resources, and they made sure that uh, the plate was clean at, at the end of every meal. That we, ne we were never, we were always reminded of uh, starving kids in Haiti. We would travel to Haiti um, periodically and uh, and go to my father's hometown, and uh, we wouldn't stay in the uh, in, in the hotels. We would stay. Um, in the hood in Haiti, right? Um, and so uh, learned, uh, learned about a different level of poverty, Haiti being the most economically disadvantaged country in the Western Hemisphere. Um, it, it was eye-opening for us as, as young people uh, growing up, my sisters and I. Um, and so I think it helped in my, in my development and my, my balance um, uh, growing up. So you, you know, you, you often tell, people often say you can't be what you don't see. I got to know Ernest LaFontaine and his wife was uh, Jewel LaFontaine. They were both uh, lawyers. Um, Jewel being the first African-American woman to graduate from the University of Chicago, uh, first woman to serve as Deputy Solicitor General for the United States. Um, having somebody like that uh, across the street from me and uh, to later encourage me as I um, was in under, undergrad um, that uh, you know law, the, pursuing the law is something that uh, I had the capacity to do and uh, at a time when I, when I was otherwise probably doubting doubting myself in that regard. So then how did you become the representative for the 13th district? Well, it was a, it was a, a, a journey of perseverance, I would say. Uh, um, many people don't know I'm a three-time loser. Uh, I've run, uh, I'd run for office unsuccessfully uh, three times, beginning, starting my first campaign a year out of law school uh, for the city council. And many people don't know the person who I ran against turned out to be 
in the long run, um, a, a close political ally, uh, Tony Pretwinkle. And uh, so I reached out and said that, uh, you know, I didn't need to be an elected official, but uh, I wanted to contribute in some way and started volunteering for her uh, organization and uh, started doing a volunteer legal clinic uh, out of her office once a month. And, um, uh, and after a number of years, uh, um, an opportunity came up. I was originally approached about the possibility of running for judge. And uh, the year where my opportunity would have come up um, to be engaged in a campaign was uh, be the, the beginning of the campaign cycle would have been in 2003. Um, that was a year where concurrently my father was dying from prostate cancer. And uh, I decided I needed as much time to spend with him and uh, decided against the notion of being engaged in a campaign at that time. Um, so my father passed away on November 6, uh, 2003. Uh, months later, Barack Obama, who was the, then the uh, state senator of the 13th Legislative District, um, emerged out of a primary um, where going into it he was far from the favorite um, um, as a victor. Uh, in, a, in a primary for for um, the U.S. Senate, um, and so uh, an opportunity came to compete for appointment uh, to replace him in the state Senate after he won the general election. And uh, you know, ironically, uh, one year after my father's death, I was appointed to uh, state senator of the 13th district. So this actually begins an interesting kind of theme throughout your political career. You succeeded Barack Obama at representing that district. You also, as now Attorney General, have succeeded Lisa Madigan, who held that office uh, for at least, what, 15, 16 years. So... And that, that was November 6th as well. Wow. Okay, so that's a very special... That, that really must mean something to you personally. Yeah. Do, you, do you feel that your dad had a hand in that, in a way? Absolutely. You know, um, uh, you know my father certainly instilled in me hard work, never quitting, um, um, embracing um, the, the policy positions that I embraced as state senator that I embrace now in the work we do in the attorney general's office, uh, advocating for access to health care. My father was old fashioned house call doc. That, uh, his office was in Woodlawn. He served in community hospitals, St. Bernard Hospital, uh, the old Hyde Park Hospital, Provident Hospital when it was black owned hospital. Um, he never turned back a patient uh, because of their inability to pay. He would come home with a block of block of cheese, a fruit cake, or a meal that somebody had prepared because they didn't have sufficient money to pay. And, you know, he believed in equity, generally. And, um, and uh, those are, that's, that's consistent with the philosophy that I've embraced, uh, whether it was in my time as state senator or now as attorney general. And you actually are one of only seven black attorneys general in the country. So... Well, you say only, but uh, this is probably the most that there's ever been historically. And when, when I came in in the class of 2018, uh, you, you had Attorneys General Keith Ellison, um, uh, Tish James, from, uh, Keith Ellison in Minnesota, Tish James in New York, um, Aaron Ford in Nevada, Carl Racine in, in, in D.C., and you had uh, Curtis Hill in, 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 in the Indiana as well. And now you have Daniel Cameron in uh, in, in, in Kentucky, and, uh, and it's, it's, it's interesting because, um, um, as I mentioned earlier, there's a lot of coalescing of uh, attorneys general in general, uh, both on a part, sometimes partisan, but you know, on a bipartisan basis as well. And to the extent that there's collective work amongst attorneys general, having a, 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 a significant presence 
within, of, of our African Americans within the room uh, makes a difference in, ter in terms of the conversation that takes place as opposed to just being one or two in the room, having, you know, six or seven in the room um, makes a difference in bringing that perspective, that life lived uh, perspective that uh, in these times um, um, where people have been able to reflect on issues of social justice and racial equity um, make a difference. Um, talking about the pandemic, it actually hit home for you. You, you had COVID, did your whole family have COVID? No, amazingly, my wife is Teflon. Um, my, my wife's an anesthesiologist and she's, she's had to intubate COVID infected patients who have had to go on uh, ventilators. And uh, uh, amazingly, um, when I was infected, she, she was not. Um, um, but um, I was infected back in June and, and it, was, it was a bit frightening. I, I think mine was mild to moderate as compared to what I've heard of others um, experience. Uh, you know, I've lost friends to, to, to uh, the coronavirus. Um, uh, I was not uh, hospitalized at all, um, but you know, knocked me on my, on my butt a little bit. <laughs> Um, and gave me time to reflect. And, uh, you know, it was maybe a month or so after the George Floyd uh, murder, and uh, it was an interesting time to um, be quarantined, right, and to, to um, spend a lot of time uh, reflecting. And I did so, and around the same time, I made the decision to uh, address my entire office with a letter uh, that I made public where um, I acknowledge something that I'd struggled with for years as a public servant is the struggle with um, um, fear of being characterized an angry black man. Um, and you surrender to the fact that you have to present yourself in a different manner. Um, not with, notwithstanding your true emotion, not, notwithstanding your true passion. I went through it during my campaign where I surrendered to campaign advisors who, who told me I can't be as passionate as, as, as others because of how it will be perceived as, as a result of me being the only African-American male candidate. Um, and so at that point of uh, reflection, I decided to communicate to my office that Yes, I, I am an angry black man, and there's a, there's a lot to be angry about. And uh, yet, how I steer it and how I utilize the energy of that is the important thing. Not to just be angry and not to lash out as a result of being angry, but to turn that into to purpose and, and to, to, to action, productive action. Um, and it's, it's okay to have conversations with people and to honest conversations without trying to make them feel guilty, but to try to move them to a place of acknowledging the things that we have tolerated as a society and what we must do to overcome it, to get them to appreciate that there is not some, um, uh, some sort of uh, evolutionary reason that um, people are, uh, black and brown people are disproportionately in, in poverty and uh, engage in the criminal justice system. Uh, there have been policies and a tolerance for policies uh, that have led to these circumstances. You know, it's okay to have these conversations in a way that uh, you can have them honestly without pointing the finger because, you know, what I did in June is um, I, I told my staff that I point the finger at me. I point the finger at me for not being fully honest about the things that uh, I was angry about, right? And because I'm one who was elected to, to be in a position to change those things. And, and if I can't be honest, fully honest about them, then I'm, it's a disservice to me 
um, affecting that change. And so last question, we're going to wrap it up. Um, what, what is the next, what's next that you hope to accomplish? Um, so I get asked that question in the, in the context oftentimes of, of running for office and, um, and, and I hate it. I'm glad you didn't really ask it in that specific way because, you know, c certain people are, are what I call climbers um, and just look at different offices that you serve in as a means to getting to another office. Uh, I never looked at my opportunities that way. Uh, it was really difficult leaving the state senate because I feel like I made a real difference there. B abolished the death penalty, uh, passed the strongest voting rights uh, protection in the country, worked on comprehensive uh, criminal justice reform, worked on a, a variety of, uh, of things there. So it was a place where I became quite comfortable that I was making a difference. Uh, but when the opportunity to serve as attorney general came up, I didn't do it because it was higher office. I, I did it because there was a, there's a platform within this office to do all of the things that I was doing in advocacy-wise in the Senate so I can continue my advocacy, but I also have an enforcement arm within this office. And so what's next is continuing to grow um, the capacity within this office to affect change. Um, this is a dream job, um, and I say that with sincerity. Uh, I am blessed with a staff here, um, people I recruit or I've retained to this office are not here because of a big paycheck, because they don't get one. Um, oftentimes I recruit people in the office and I say, hey, by the way, you've got to take this significant level of a pay cut, and they come, and I talk about people with the, of the highest pedigree, um, they come because of the substantive work we get to do here uh, that saves lives, that makes a difference in people's lives. And to the extent that I can continue to build that out in here, build our capacity here, because you know we're underfunded um, for what we return, first of all, monetarily to the state, but secondly, what we return value-wise to the lives of the citizens of the state of Illinois. Uh, you know, there are ways that the Attorney General's office impact people that, you know, the common person just doesn't, doesn't realize it. And I'm proud to be at the helm of this office. Excellent. Well, thank you so much for thank sitting you. down and talking to us and kind of, clearly you do have a passion for what you do. I mean, that's what brought you here. So, and, and I think that's what serves people well when they, when they really love what they do. And um, because there's going to be a challenge no matter what. And um, especially in this time, when you were describing all this, the social upheaval, you know, that's, that's really got to be, um, and it's not ending, you know, there's, that's, it's still happening. So I'm sure that's a real challenge. But yeah. I do appreciate you sharing some insight. Yeah, if I could say just in closing, I, 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 first of all, thank you. Yeah. Um, um, you, you, you've made a point in closing about serving in this time. I think there's, there's, there's been no time historically where who you elect as your state attorney general matters as much as it does today because of the way we collaborate um, with one another and because of how we've been empowered within our respective states to, to make a change and, and because of the lens that people are looking at things from a social justice and equity standpoint. Um, and um, I take that responsibility seriously. But, so I thank you for the opportunity to talk about it. Excellent. All righty. Great. Thank you. Thank you.